Hello and welcome back to the IEA channel. I'm Emily Carver. Um, thanks for joining us this evening for the fourth episode of the Definite Article. Um, tonight I am joined by Christopher Snowden. He's our Head of Lifestyle Economics at the IEA. Um, Chris has been extremely busy um, during this lockdown. He's been writing, researching and has been a regular on the channel here. Um, we were talking about liberty after the lockdown last time, which was another paper that he's written. Um, but this evening, we're going to be discussing his most recent article for The Spectator, which is entitled, Are Public Health Cuts to Blame for the UK's Pandemic Response? Um, and this is based on Chris's most recent briefing paper, uh, False Economies, Myths About Public Health Spending. Um, in this paper, he argues that the claims made that the UK's response to coronavirus have been weakened um, by cuts of public health finance don't hold water. In fact, as Chris points out in his article, uh, Public Health England's budget for infectious disease prevention in fact rose from 52 million in 2014-15 to 86.9 million in 2018-19. Um, we're also going to touch upon his uh, new blog, which you can find on the IEA website, um, about the pseudo-economics of preventative care, um, which is based on the second part of his paper. Um, before we begin, don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, um, share, and um, check out our website where you can sign up to our new IEA Daily newsletter. Um, and if you're watching live now, don't be shy, go ahead and fire some questions at Chris. I'll do my best to pick up on as many as I can. Hi, Chris. Hello, Emily, how are you doing? I'm good, thanks for joining me. My pleasure. Why should so, we start? <laughs> so before we um, discuss your article for The Spectator, can I start by asking you a bit about Boris's speech last night and also the paper, the 51-page plan that was uh, published earlier today? Um, last night you commented that, commented that you don't believe the Prime Minister is being straight with the public, um, that he keeps moving the goalposts over the justification of the lockdown. Um, what do you make of the government's new exit strategy then? Hello, Chris. Sorry, just uh, <laughs> lost the sound for a second. Uh, no, I, I got the question. Um, I, I thought the, the, the paper that was published today made things quite a bit clearer than the Prime Minister did uh, last night. Um, they seem to be now pursuing neither a strategy of stopping the NHS being overwhelmed, nor one of attempting eradication. I don't think eradication is realistically possible. Uh, Wuhan has now got some new cases, I, I saw today, as has uh, South Korea, and they were doing so well and had, had done so much to, to stamp out the virus. Uh, and so instead, they're, they're doing something in between, um, which I still don't think is quite the prospectus that we were sold the lockdown on in the first place. Having said that, it does make sense. No, you know, no, nobody wants to go into full lockdown again. And clearly, if we have a very large number of cases and it starts spreading rapidly, then we'll, we'll have to do it again. So it makes sense in terms of both saving lives and you know, ultimately protecting people's liberty to stamp it out so much as is possible. And so if you're not doing either of those strategies, if you're not going for eradication and you're not merely trying to protect the NHS, then how far you should go in relaxing the lockdown becomes a matter partly of opinion, part, partly a matter of scientific fact. And it's not clear uh, at the moment what the infection rate is, the R number. It's somewhere apparently between 0.5 and 0.9, which is quite a spread. And if it's 0.9, then you were getting close to potentially seeing exponential growth again. So, I mean, there, that is a question for the scientists. Sage have modelled. Um, this kind of stuff. And they've said it's not safe to open the primary schools yet. I don't know. I've seen com very conflicting evidence um, about the role of, of schools and school children in spreading it. But yeah, I'm not a scientist. I'm not going to go into that other than to say that we are, we have definitely moved along from where we were May, uh, March 23rd. Um, we were sold this on the basis that we couldn't allow ourselves to be in the position that Italy was in in, uh, in in March. 
Um, and we clearly have avoided that and could clearly avoid it relatively easily again. Um, but exactly where we should be, I don't know. The o- only other thing I'd say is that the very you know, minor announcements that were made by the Prime Minister yesterday, almost none of them actually uh, are involve the law being changed or relaxed. The guidance on exercise, for example, you know, people are making a big song and dance about the fact that you can exercise more than once a day. Now, that has never been illegal anyway in England. It has apparently been illegal in, in Wales and Scotland. It hasn't been in, in England. The only meaningful relaxation of freedom will happen on Wednesday when people will be able to meet one person from outside their household outdoors if they socially distance. So good news if you want to play tennis against one other friend. I believe that will be legal. Um, so that's progress of a sort. My own personal opinion is we, we need to be doing much more in terms of opening up the economy. None of the stuff that's been announced is going to help the economy. And even the stuff that seemed to confuse some people uh, about how people working in construction, for example, should go back to work. Again, they were never banned from going to work. The, it's just that the government did such a good job of scaring people that a lot of people decided to stay at home. Oh, they also, of course, introduced a furlough scheme, which gave people an economic incentive to, to stay at home. So the stuff that was announced yesterday and indeed today in the paper, for the most part, isn't a change to the legislation whatsoever. It's just a change to advice and a bit of encouragement. Yeah, I mean, if we looking forward, I mean, in Germany, we've seen when the country has eased the lockdown restrictions, the number of infections has risen, apparently, according to new data. Um, what What's your thoughts on that? Do you think that we'll suddenly come back to a second lockdown if the numbers increase? Is the government so frightened to sort of adopt any approach that could lead to even one more death? Um, are we stuck here until vaccine or herd immunity? I don't think they'd go that far. Um, the The answer to the kind of issues that you see in Germany and now again in South Korea are not lockdowns unless they get to a really severe point. They, they are contact tracing and mass testing. And I thought for some time now that insofar as the government has a strategy, it is to stall for time while they get the the contact tracing and the testing sorted. And it's interesting from a free market point of view, actually, um, why we've fallen so short on both those issues, the contact testing, was one of the few responsibilities that Public Health England has, um, sorry, not the contact testing, the, the diagnostic testing um, was Public Health England's responsibility and has been as has been well documented now, particularly by, um, by Matthew Lesh at the Anne Smith Institute, they were unable to get anywhere near the level of testing that was required because they took a very uh, public sector centralised view of this and wouldn't return the calls of anybody from industry who was trying to help them out, that has now changed and we're now up to genuinely up to 100,000 tests as of today without even fiddling the figures. Um, and it, it's kind of the same thing with the with the contact tracing app, which really does look like it's going to be a, a huge disaster now, not least because so many people are terrified of, um, of signing up for it because there's a lot of weird conspiracy mm. theories about it, combined with, to be fair, genuine privacy issues. Um, but again, That was because the government didn't want to get involved with the private sector. It wanted to do it all itself. So we've got two major problems there. Um, The two big issues that we need in order to manage this, not eradicate it, but manage this in the long term, um, we've not been able to roll out in time. It's cost us several more weeks in lockdown, and therefore it's cost us many billions of pounds. Yeah, I mean, in your article, you say that you know, a lot of people are claiming that um, the UK's where we've been slow to react is just due to funding issues, that Public Health England hasn't responded as well as it should because it hasn't been given enough money. And you debunk this in your article. Could you sort of talk us through the main thrust of your argument? Well, when you look at a, a very extraordinary event like a pandemic of this kind, it's very easy to, for everybody to have 2020 hindsight. And I don't want to do that. Um, you know, th- there was no way that Public Health England, under any circumstances, would have just been able to come out in February saying, oh, we've developed a vaccine for this, you don't need to worry about it anymore. We need to be realistic about it. Um, and most people are, have been acting in good faith, certainly, and probably working as hard as they can to deal with this. So I don't want to get too much into the blame game. 
But when people say, well, this is just an issue of, of chronic underfunding and it's because of austerity and what have you, um, I, they are just wrong about that. Now, in the most trivial sense, you can say that if Public Health England or the NHS had an extra few billion pounds, then they would have been able to buy all the PPE and the ventilators uh, and what have you that, that, that we were short of. And that, that's been the genuine scandal. Um, mm -hmm. during the course of COVID-19 in this country is a lack of PPE, I think, beyond anything else. And that clearly is something that we could have prepared better for. So although it's trivially true to say that if they'd had more money, they, they could have spent it on these things, the real question is, if they'd have had more money, would they have spent it on these things? And there is no reason whatsoever to believe that they would have done. Um, and one reason to not think that is that they've actually got a huge amount of money and they have been spending it on things that, to me, look trivial at the time. And I think in the context of a global pandemic, should look pretty trivial to everybody else. So Public Health England gets a budget of just over £4 billion a year. Most of that, more than three quarters, about £3.3 billion last year, it's gone up a bit since then, goes to local authorities. In every local authority, you have a local public health director. And as of 2013, local authorities are supposed to be in charge of public health provision. Public Health England then has several hundred thousand, um, sorry, several hundred million pounds of its own to spend on various things, including pandemic preparation. Pandemic preparation is not the responsibility of local councils. Um, and you can understand why that would be, you know, the, the, you, you, you employ virologists and, and you know, serious scientists to um, you know, trace these things around the world, look into the possibility of vaccines and so on. So that is pretty much centralised within Public Health England. Local authorities have seen a cut, um, as they have in, in many parts of the budget over the last 10 years. They've, they've seen a cut in the ring fence public health grant. Now, I would still argue that 3.3 billion is, is quite a bit of money. Um, what are they spending it on? Um, well, this is no secret. Um, it's not pandemic preparation in any real sense at all. Uh, there's a lot on general kind of well-being stuff. Um, there's 220 million on obesity. There's, uh, I think, well over 100 million on tobacco control. I mean, these are all larger sums than Public Health England spends on preparing for novel epidemics, which is what we're dealing with. Public Health England also spends money on routine vaccinations. They're in charge of the you know, stockpiling TB vaccinations, MMR and so on. Um, and of course, these are infectious diseases, but they're not the kind of infectious diseases that we're looking at now. It also has a stockpile of other vaccines for things like H1N1. Um, and in fact, they, they do spend a lot of money on that, and so they should. They actually threw away last year more than £200 million worth of vaccines because they um, gone past their shelf life. Uh, nothing wrong with that. Um, you know, that, that's what happens. They have a shelf life. Um, but they spend a lot of money on all sorts of things. Public Health England have been spending a huge amount of money on uh, various obesity campaigns in particular. They've been spending millions trying to get food manufacturers to take out bits of sugar from biscuits and cakes and so on. Um, so my point is, in a rather long-winded way, my point is that there has been money there. Um, we could have been spending the money we've been spending on obesity, for example, or tobacco control, yeah. uh, any number of other things, on stockpiling face masks, ventilators, what have you. They haven't been. Not only have they not been doing it, it's not even really their responsibility to do it. I don't quite understand why that is, because it is, by their own mission, their primary objective to prepare for epidemics like this. Yeah, so I want to ask you, how do we, A... Where's the accountability there? Is there accountability? And two, to play devil's advocate here, um, surely if there's money going into public health, um, so um, clearly it's to prevent people from becoming obese, to prevent people from developing chronic conditions, which have been shown to be, you know, make the situation worse for people when it comes to coronavirus, um, they're risk factors. So could you argue that um, putting money into prevention or putting money into public health initiatives could have helped slow the tide of coronavirus for people with those risk factors? 
Well, firstly, there's really very little evidence that any of these anti-obesity schemes work. Mm. Um, it seems to me money down the drain all the time. You know, 200 odd million pounds a year is spent on obesity. Obesity rates amongst adults continue rising. Obesity rates amongst children, which are meaningless anyway, because they're not properly uh, measured, um, haven't gone up, but they haven't gone down either. I mean, there doesn't seem to be any evidence that the, the, these policies are working. Um, secondly, yes, it is true that of all the kind of lifestyle factors that people have been desperately trying to pin on uh, COVID-19, because there's a, I believe, a kind of natural desire to find some kind of moral reason why people are suffering from these kind of uh, epidemics, just as during the Black Death, people assumed it was some kind of punishment from, from God for various things. The only one that has stuck has been obesity. Smoking, if anything, seems to reduce your chances of getting COVID-19. This has been the most extraordinary scientific funding of, of recent weeks. Alcohol doesn't seem to really have any effect either way. There'll be people saying that you know, very heavy drinking reduces your immune system, and maybe that's true, but I, mean, I, I don't think there are any studies showing that there's any meaningful difference, really, um, between non-drinkers and drinkers. Obesity is different, particularly morbid obesity. Uh, overweight, being overweight doesn't seem to make any difference. Being mildly obese maybe increases your risk of, of complications and therefore death. And being morbidly obese majorly increases your risk. You know, we're talking two or three fold increase. But it doesn't make the virus any more contagious. You know, a fat, a fat person who is uh, who has got coronavirus is no more contagious than anybody else. They've just got a worse outlook when they go to hospital, which is really, you know, their problem, you know, yeah. uh, the, the, it doesn't make it more of a public health issue. Uh, people who are obese are more at risk for all sorts of things. But I would argue that doesn't make them public health issues. And this really gets to the heart of the matter, which is that a public health agency should be focused exclusively, I would say, on genuine public health issues. And over the course of recent decades, we have distorted and changed the meaning of the term public health which used to be about issues that were collective, that required a collective solution, um, and that the individual couldn't deal with themselves. Individuals can decide for themselves what to eat. They can make that trade-off between weight and eating pleasure or the, the you know, satisfaction not having to get up in the morning, go for a jog. These are purely individual issues. Individuals are quite capable of losing weight on their own. The government actually is pretty bad at helping them lose weight. So it, obesity is not a public health issue. It's never been a public health issue. Smoking isn't, alcohol isn't. Um, the pub, real genuine, genuine public health issues are infectious diseases and environmental hazards, basically. And that is about so, it. So how much of our, the money that, um, so how much of Public Health England funding goes to these sort of public health um, nanny state type interventions? And also, we've got a question also on the figures. I don't know if you know the exact figures, but how much? What have the annual budgets been for Public Health England in the last few years? Have they every year gone up, or have there been falls and rises? Um, Public Health England's operating budget, as they were called, I don't think has declined. The Public Health Grant has declined a bit since around about 2015, 2016. It's quite difficult to make a historical comparison and to say that. Or, you know, even though it has fallen a bit in the last few years, and by the way, gone up 5% this year, mm -hmm. um, but it, yeah, it has dropped a little bit over the course of the last few years. It's difficult to say whether that is, is high or low meaningfully because there wasn't a public health budget until 2014, really. Um, so maybe it was just very high in 2014 when, they, when mm -hmm. they started all this and they rearranged public health and created Public Health England and put public health responsibilities back to local authorities. How much do they spend on nanny state stuff? It's kind of difficult to say. Certainly well over £300 million goes on tobacco control and obesity. The public health England itself doesn't really break down the figures. So we can't, for example, look at how much it spends on its food reformulation strategy, which has been one of its big deals. We can't tell how much it, it, it spends kind of pushing alcohol, alcohol, alcohol control measures or indeed tobacco control measures but it's certainly a very important part of what they do and if you look at their annual reports you'll see them going on a great deal about these things being the great epidemics of our time and they say very little about uh, you know prospective uh, genuine epidemics of the future epidemic is another word that's been distorted and had, had its meaning entirely changed purely for political reasons 
The reason that we have redefined things like obesity and smoking as public health issues is a, is a, is political. It's it's about rhetoric. It makes it seem as if the government needs to get involved in these areas when actually it doesn't. The use of the word epidemic, which we've been using about things like childhood obesity and even gambling in recent years, um, is equally inaccurate. The, you know, the, the, there is no contagious element. That's the, one of the main distinguishing features. Before we move on to your, uh, your IEA blog, um, which is on the pseudo-economics of preventative um, cause, uh, we've got a few questions from YouTube. Um, someone wants to know, is the government too scared or was too scared of the political consequences of outsourcing testing to the private sector? Do you think that was the issue there when it came to the... Well, obviously, I can't read anyone's mind. I, I suspect probably not really. Um, I, I see The Guardian today had a piece about one of the companies involved in this area um, employing Owen Patterson uh, in some kind of capacity, and the suggestion there was it was all you know greasy palms and so on. I uh, but I don't know how much the government is worried about things like that. I think it was more of a, a, a general institutional mentality. Yeah. That we want to do this ourselves. We're, we're the experts. We can do this. We don't care what the rest of the world is doing. The rest of the world might be using Apple and Google, but we can do this better. You know, it's a dangerous public sector mentality that has failed really quite disastrously in both these instances. Yeah. So let's move on to your um, blog. Um, so in your blog, you note that it's commonly cited that um, every one pound spent on public health in the UK saves an average 14 pounds so that sounds brilliant to anyone reading it i'm sure um firstly how do they get to that figure okay so this is the justification for spending more money and the idea that if you cut public health at all it is always a false economy and lots of people um distinguished people have been saying this for years and it seems on the face of it to be you know almost a banal truism you know uh, an ounce of uh, prevention is worth a pound of cure and all this kind of stuff. Well, yeah, up to a point, and possibly at the individual level, um, it, it is quite true purely in terms of health. It doesn't work in terms of money. If you're actually talking about spending money on prevention, um, then what do you mean that you get £14 back? Do you get £14 back in terms of the economy grows by £14 for every pound put in? Do you mean that taxpayers save £14 for every pound goes in? Because that would be great. That would mean that if you spent £10 billion on preventive health, we could cut the NHS budget by £140 billion, almost wiping it out. That's not how it works, of course. And this particular figure, this 14 to 1 return on investment figure, is misunderstood, actually, even by the authors of the study who produced it, who seem to think it's, a, it's literally a cash return. It's not at all. Um, if you put an arbitrary valuation on a year of life, and you assume that these policies actually work, then if you're saving millions of life years, then suddenly you're reaping billions of pounds in intangible costs. But those costs are, as the term it suggests, intangible. Nobody actually makes any money from it. These are not cash returns. They're not savings to the taxpayer. Um, they are benefits bestowed entirely on the individual who gets to live a bit longer. Now, that's not worthless. I mean, that's the point of the health service is to, is to help people live longer in, in better health. I'm not dismissing it, but it's not a cash return. It's really an apples and oranges comparison to say that, oh, we must spend another a billion pound it because we'll get 14 billion pound back. No, we'll get at a push, we'll get between us 14 billion pounds worth of life, if that's how you want to look at it. But that even that's not quite as great as it seems if you're dealing with lifestyle habits, which of course public health increasingly is. Um, because when you're dealing with lifestyle behaviors, you know, people like me who drink too much or people who are smoking or eating too much, um, there's a trade-off there, which the individual is making. And maybe I value drinking too much more than I value an extra five years at the end of my life. That's not really for the government to decide. And if it, by you using taxation or regulation, prevents me from drinking the optimal amount, as I perceive it, then 
those benefits at the end of my life, they need to be discounted quite a bit. We need to subtract all the benefits I would have got from, from drinking fine wine every evening. Um, so it really doesn't work with the nanny state stuff. Yeah. So, but um, also, isn't there the argument, and I know you've spoken about this before, that um, smokers and drinkers, i.e. people who die earlier, cost the NHS less. So there's also that calculation there that doesn't come up so much. Yeah, right. Yeah. I mean, then, then you're talking about real money. These are not intangible benefits to individuals. Yeah. These are, This is actually taxpayers' money. Um, and the taxpayer pays uh, into two relevant pots here. One is, of course, the NHS. The other one, which people tend to overlook, is the welfare system, by which I mean primarily pensions, but also other benefits that people in old age um, tend to withdraw. And the evidence is absolutely cut and dried in the case of smoking, has been for years, that even if smokers didn't pay extortionate rates of tobacco duty, which of course they do, um, the fact that they lay down their lives early, as um, Sir Humphrey says in Yes, Yes Minister, means that actually the non-smoking taxpayer saves a great deal on all those pensions that they don't have to pay for. The evidence is less clear with uh, obesity, to be fair. Seems to me pretty much a wash. There are some studies that suggest that there's a net cost from people being obese, uh, and certainly it does lead to diseases a bit earlier in life. Uh, it tends to make people less productive, uh, less likely to work at all in, in its extreme form. Uh, we can, we, we, we uh, produced a study at the IEA a few years ago in which we found that there was perhaps, if you use you know, pretty uh, conservative public health figures, which is to say probably exaggerations, um, maybe a net cost of £2 billion a year, which is a lot less than the 10, 20, 30 billion pounds a year public health people claim. And with alcohol, there's definitely a, a cost if you don't tax a product because there are so many other issues around alcohol in terms of crime. Um, and also people, you know, although relatively few people drink uh, die from alcohol as compared to smoking and obesity, they tend to die at a younger age and therefore they're not working and, and, and paying income tax. But the economist's answer to that is you put a tax, you put a Pagovian tax on the product. And of course we do at a massive rate. The UK drinkers pay some of the highest taxes on alcohol in the world, which far exceed any conceivable negative externality, pay well over twice as much as they would do if it was a properly targeted Pagovian tax. So to sort of finish, um, in, an I in an ideal world after the coronavirus pandemic is over and you were given the opportunity to look at Public Health England and think about how it could be reformed how do you think that you know it could be better structured do you think that it shouldn't even be um working towards things like um preventative um campaigns and nanny state sort of things do you think that that should be completely not in its remit at all it should leave obesity it should leave alcohol tobacco whatever i would like to see an organization whose stated aim is first and foremost to prevent outbreaks of infectious diseases to be totally focused in that area. Uh, that might require it getting quite a bit less money because it's not spending money on all sorts of uh, you know, extraneous rubbish. Um, but it would be an organization that would lead from the front on occasions such as this. And you might say, oh, well, this is a once in a hundred years event, you know, so they wouldn't be doing anything the rest of the time. Actually, no, there, there are a lot of outbreaks of various forms of viral disease. And let's give credit to the virologists for getting a handle, a handle on them in the past and dealing with them. There's also routine vaccinations for long-standing infectious diseases. So these people would not be twiddling their, their thumbs for decades at a time, but they would be able to lead. And I found it fascinating that Public Health England have been almost invisible throughout this entire pandemic. It's been the chief medical officer and his deputy. It's been the chief scientific advisor. It's been the NHS, Department of Health. They're the people who have been at least front facing in dealing with this epidemic, whereas the, the chief exec of Public Health England has been the invisible man throughout the entire thing. And if you look at what they're actually doing, what, what have they done? Well, they told us that there wouldn't be a problem in care homes. That was a great contribution. They told us well, they, they were in charge of the diagnostic te testing, which they, they mucked up terribly. I think they should have been responsible for driving the whole thing right through from stockpiling face masks and PPE to being on the TV during the daily briefings. 
the entire responsibility should have been theirs because they're the public health agency. We created them primarily for this purpose. And so I would I would move away from the system we've currently got, in which it seems to be the NHS, Department of Health, the local public health directors and public health England. No one's quite sure who's responsible. And in the end, people just blame the government. Oh, it's Boris yeah. Johnson's fault for personally not signing a check for face masks. You know? um, so I would slim it down enormously so it was only dealing with infectious diseases. And if there is still public demand, for an agency to be telling us to eat our greens and pressuring the food companies to take sugar out of cakes, then fine, we could have you know something have something separate. You can have the nanny state, you know, nanny state England could be doing that, and you get <laughs> the budget, and okay, you can you can pay attention to them or you can't. But public health England should be entirely and wholly devoted towards infectious disease and environmental hazards, genuine public health collective problems i think a lot of people would agree with you there chris thank you so much for joining us on uh, the definite article uh, that was christopher snowden he's our head of lifestyle economics um at the iea if you would like to uh read his article it's in this description box the spectator one and also the iea blog um and also please do like um, like this video and subscribe to our YouTube channel. We've got huge amounts of videos, as you probably know if you're watching. Um, we've got a new one coming out every day. So please do check them out and um, we'll see you next Monday. Bye. Okay.